Hello everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk at this nice conference. Uh, the broad topic of my talk concerns uh, dynamical aspects of discrete subgroups of Lie groups. More precisely, I will talk about Patterson tree event densities for discrete groups of projective transformations. Let me mention that I won't talk much about anos of groups, fortunately. I will just mention the link between those and the groups that we consider here, convex compact groups. Uh, after that, I will discuss about Patterson Sullivan densities and their associated Sullivan measures. And finally, I will state the main result, which is the mixing property for the Sullivan measures. The setting is uh, the following. We fix a real vector space V and uh, a discrete subgroup gamma of PGLV. We assume for convenience that gamma is torsion free and also strongly reducible, meaning that it does not preserve any finite union of projective subspaces of PV. Recall that projective uh, anos of groups can be seen as uh, generalizations of convex co-compact subgroups of POD1, the group of isometries of the real hyperbolic space, HD, which can be seen as a subspace of uh, the projective space as below. Uh, a group gamma of POD1 acts convex compactly on HD if there exists a convex closed gamma invariant subset of HD on which gamma acts co-compactly. Co the, the main properties of convex compact groups that extend to another groups are the following. Uh, gamma is world hyperbolic because it is quasi-invariant, quasi-isometric to k, k, which is a group of hyperbolic. Every element gamma of, uh, of gamma is uh, hyperbolic as an isometry of HD, and hence it is a proximal projective transformation meaning that it has an attracting fixed point x gamma plus in the projective space. Also, um, associated to gamma, we have a limit set, which in particular can be described as uh, the proximal limit set of gamma. The proximal limit set is well defined for any discrete subgroup of PGLV. It is defined as a closure of the set of attracting fixed point uh, of proximal elements. Um, and uh, most importantly, we have a natural identification between the boundary at infinity of gamma, seen as a, uh, an abstract world hyperbolic group, and its proximal limit set when we see gamma as a subgroup of PGLV. The identification sends attracting fixed point in the boundary at infinity to attracting fixed point in the projective space. More generally, for any projective another subgroup of PGLV, we also have that gamma is world hyperbolic, all its elements are proximal, and we also have an identification between subboundary at infinity and the proximal limit set. The group that we consider here are another uh, generalization of convex compact subgroup of POD1, namely convex co compact groups in uh, the projective space. This notion is due to we assume for the rest of the talk that gamma preserves a, a subset omega of PV which is open and properly convex, meaning that there exists an affine chart in which omega is convex and bounded. For example, omega could be a ball, in which case gamma is conjugate into POD1, or omega could be something more complicated, for example, with triangles like that in the boundary. Um, so the first naive generalizations of convex compactness is the following. One can say that gamma acts co naively convex co compactly on omega if there exists a closed convex gamma invariant subset on which gamma acts co compactly. This notion is not the notion we will consider. For some reasons that are well explained uh, in Danziger Gaito Cassel's paper, one would say that this is not the right notion. Roughly, the idea uh, is that uh, k, uh, k might be too small and not maybe capture the whole dynamics of gamma. So we will ask that gamma act co-compactly co on a sufficiently large convex set, namely the 
convex hull of the full orbital limit set, which is the set of the, the union of all accumulation points of all gamma orbits. Uh, the, con the convex hull of the full orbital limit set is called the convex core, and gamma is said to act convex compactly on omega if it acts co compactly on the convex core, which is uh, also asked to be non empty, of course. A uh, few remarks on, uh, on convex compactness. First, uh, there exist interesting examples of uh, convex compact groups for which gamma is non hyperbolic. So convex compact groups are, uh, is not a particular case of another group. Second, in general, the proximal limit set uh, is different from the full orbital limit set. We have two, two limit sets. And because of this, the, proximal, the limit set of uh, convex compact group is in general more complicated in certain ways than uh, those of uh, Anosov groups. However, unlike Anosov groups, convex compact uh, groups in the sense of TGK preserve, have this uh, nice feature that they preserve a nice metric on a subset of the protective space, namely the Hilbert metric on omega. Let me recall what the uh, Hilbert metric is. The Hilbert distance between two points x and y is defined as one half the logarithm of the projective cross ratio of the four unaligned points A, X, Y, B. This metric happens to be proper, namely closed balls or compact. It is also gamma invariant and projective segments are geodesic. This metric uh, can be very useful. We will use it here to construct a, a nice quasi gamma invariant measure on the projective boundary. This is what will be the patterson sullivan measure. And it will be on the projective boundary of omega, more precisely. So let me recall roughly, uh, let's say, what I understood of the idea of uh, patterson sullivan measures. Those measures should how, tell you how accumulation points of a given orbit are distributed in the boundary. For example, here on the drawing, no accumulation points uh, no points accumulate on A, so the measure of A should be zero. And uh, more precisely, uh, much more points accumulate on B than on C. It seems to be true. <laughs> and uh, in fact, for the measure we will consider, the measure of C will be zero, while the measure of B uh, should be positive. Uh, so one way to, to make concrete such a measure mu uh, could, uh, could be to take the following definition. We could say, well, look at the cone directed toward B, CB. Uh, CB. And for each uh, ball of radius R, Around P, B or P, count the proportion of points which are in the cone and uh, look at the limit when R goes to infinity. So this is a bit the idea, and a rigorous way to, more rigorous way to define U is to, to, to define it as an accumulation point in the space of probability measures on omega bar of a sequence of sums of direct masses for each uh, orbit point in the ball, put a direct mass and renormalize then uh, look at an accumulation point when R goes to infinity one can check that the mass of this measure uh, is going to escape to infinity, and so the accumulation point mu will be concentrated on the boundary. So this is a, this could be a nice uh, metric to measure to look at. 
But this is not the, the measure that we will consider. We will consider another construction due to Sullivan, which is uh, very similar, but a bit different. This construction uses the critical exponent, which is the exponential growth rate of any gamma orbit. And, and the construction also uses a point carry series. These two objects are classical. This point carry series is infinite if uh, before the critical exponent and finite after. And uh, so the measure, the Patterson Sullivan measure, will be also a limit of weighted sum of Dirac mass on orbit points, but with a different weights than before. And we renormalize. And we take an accumulation point when S goes to delta gamma by above. So this is possible because it happens that in our case, the critical exponent is finite. And also as before, the escape, the mass of uh, the sequence of uh, measure escape to infinity. And so uh, because the critical exponent diverges at the, uh, the point carry diverges at the critical exponent under the assumption that gamma is compact. We, so we make this assertion. And, um, and so uh, the mass escape to infinity and mu is uh, concentrated on the boundary. So now the question is, uh, is uh, gamma quasi-invariant and could you have a nice formula for the radon coding co-cycle? And uh, so this is a consequence of the general theory of Patterson-Sullivan measures, which are defined for general proper metric space. Uh, they live on a special boundary called the horror boundary. So I recall that the Hora boundary is the smallest boundary where uh, the Boosman functions are well defined. I recall here the, the definition of the Boosman functions, whose level sets are the Hora spheres. Uh, and the Hora spheres are limits of spheres of X for the metric D. I recall also that the Hora boundary gives rise to a compactification called the Hora compactification. X bar H. The result of Patterson is then the following for any discrete group of isometries gamma. Um, if the critical exponent is finite and the point carry diverges at the critical exponent, then any accumulation point mu h uh, of the same uh, sequence as before, but in a, in a different compactification, the horror compactification, any accumulation point is a Patterson Sullivan measure. Uh, in other words, it is gamma invariant, gamma quasi invariant, sorry. And uh, we have a formula for the Radon coding derivative, which involves the Boosman functions and the critical exponent. Sorry, P is here. Any gamma, any gamma, uh, xi in the horrible. So, uh, as you can see, and as uh, you probably probably already know, Patterson Sullivan measures are well defined in a lot of uh, geometric context. For example, they've been used in success with success uh, in the context of discrete groups of isometries of non positively curved Riemannian manifold. In particular, um, the results uh, pre present here in the projective setting has been proved for a long time, uh, have analogs in the Riemannian setting, which have been known for a long time. Uh, also note that Patterson-Sullivan measure in the present setting, the projective setting, have already been considered before, for, uh, among others by Michael Crampon, Harrison Bray, and also Feng Shu. 
so if we go back to the protective setting, uh, one can note that the uh, Patterson's result does not immediately imply that the measure mu on the protective boundary is uh, gamma quasi invariance. Uh, to, to see this, we, we need to make the link between the horror boundary and the productive boundary. Uh, in general, these two boundaries are different, but uh, results of Walsh that the horror boundary is always dominates the projective boundary, meaning that there exists a onto projection, continuous projection, sorry, which extends the identity on A. And uh, thanks to this, the, the measure mu on, on projective boundary is gamma quasi-invariant because it is a push forward of a gamma quasi-invariant measure on the whole boundary, namely a Patterson-Sullivan measure. We call mu a Patterson-Sullivan measure on d omega. So Patterson-Sullivan measures have a lot of applications among them, one can use them to, to construct an interesting gamma invariant measure on the projective space times the projective space. This measure is going to be absolutely continuous with respect to mu times mu. Um, so we introduce a set of geodesics on omega, g omega, which we see as a subset of the set of pairs of points of the boundary of the boundary, projective boundary. So here, psi and eta uh, give rise to a geodesic if the projective lines between them intersect omega. And we also consider the pre-image of g omega inside the horror boundary times the horror boundary. We call it g h omega. Uh, g h omega uh, has this nice feature that it has a well-defined Gromov product. I recall here the definition of the Gromov product. Recall that in the case of the real hyperbolic space, for example, the program of product is approximately the distance uh, between x and the geodesic. For general projective uh, properly convex open set, it's not true anymore. We just have one uh, inequality that remains true. Um, so thanks to the Gromov product, we can uh, use Sullivan's formula. It works well in the projective setting, and we define the following measure. CP. Which is absolutely continuous with respect to mu times mu. And uh, so mu h, sorry, on g h omega. And one can, uh, it's elementary to check that this measure is gamma invariant and rather, and uh, that the push, push forward MR on G omega also uh, satisfies these properties. So note that uh, actually the measure MR might be zero, which is not very interesting for us. So we, to avoid this problem, we will make an extra assumption called the rank one assumption. It was which was introduced by Mithul Islam. By the way, Mithul gave a talk on this topic at last year's Nearly Carbon Neutral Conference, which I encourage to watch. Uh, if gamma at convex compactly on omega, uh, the rank one condition can be formulated as follows. Uh, is equivalent to saying that uh, there exists a pair of points in the proximal limit set which give rise to a geodesic in omega. And this implies that the measure MR is non-zero uh, because in fact the proximal limit set is, the, the reason is that the proximal limit set can be shown to be a subset of the support of mu. So we have a non-zero measure gamma invariant measure on G omega. And this gamma invariant measure satisfies a useful dynamical property. To be able to state this property, we need to adopt a different point of view. 
on MR, we need to see it as a measure on T1 omega over gamma. Uh, T1 omega is so the unit tangent bundle of omega. And uh, it naturally projects to the space of geodesic as follows. If we have a vector V, we can consider the geodesic spine by V. So V is sent to Xi eta. And uh, this projection uh, may allow us to identify G omega with a quotient of T1 omega by the action of some flow, a geodesic flow. It is a flow which uh, parametrizes projective lines, parametrizes geodesics, like this. And uh, the projection map uh, is gamma invariant, so we also have a gamma action on T1 omega, and it is gamma in equivariant, sorry. And so uh, we have a natural correspondence between gamma invariant radon measures on the omega and uh, gamma and phi t invariant radon measures above. And similarly, we have another quotient of T1 omega, T1 omega over gamma, on which acts also acts the geodesic flow. And we have another correspondence here with a set of phi t invariant radon measures. So uh, we can consider the push forward through these correspondences of MR, and we obtain measure M gamma. And this measure M gamma is mixing with respect to the geodesic flow. This is the result. So let me recall briefly what mixing means. Here, for any two measurable subsets, A and B, if we flow B for a big gain of time, it will equidistribute in the whole space, and in particular, uh, also it will equidistribute in A. Okay, phi tb, tb. So uh, m gamma is finite and mixing. Uh, note that this theorem actually holds under. Uh, we, we don't need actually the convex compact assumption for, to prove this, um, but uh, it simplifies the proof. And also note that uh, the mixing property was uh, previously proved by Feng Shu under some additional hypothesis that I don't detail. Uh, to end the talk, I would like to uh, mention an example of application of the mixing property. This, uh, this, uh, this application is classical in other contexts, such as uh, the setting of uh, uh, non positively curved Riemannian manifold. It is a counting result on conjugacy classes of gamma. So the following is a joint work, result from a joint work with Feng Shu. We use mixing to prove that the set, the number of conjugacy classes in gamma with length less than t is equivalent to uh, exponential delta gamma t over delta gamma t. The length of uh, gamma is defined as follows. It is one half the logarithm of the, the top eigenvalue with maximal modulus over the bottom eigenvalue with uh, minimal eigenvalue. Uh, note that this result doesn't involve at all the, the properly convex open set omega. It is uh, 
it's stated purely in terms of the group gamma. Thank you for listening and have a nice conference.